Father in heaven, we thank you again for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. And although that time back then was very gloomy and was full of despair and full of defeat, we look back now knowing that you knew all along that you were going to have victory. And that early, the first day of the week, Jesus would rise from the grave defeating death, defeating sin. And Father, we want to learn more about that victory. Learn more about what you want in our lives. So I ask that you'll speak to us this morning. Speak through me, I pray. That your words are heard and not mine. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when I was uh, younger, I was told that when you became a Christian, things changed. Things were different after you decided to follow Christ. I was told that after you choose Christ as your Savior, your life changes. And I found this to be true. Have you? I, I was told that life would be more complete. I found that to be also true. I heard that life would be more enjoyable. Right again. In fact, I think it's fun to be a Christian. It should be fun to be a Christian. Sometimes you can't tell because we, we, we sing songs like Victory in Jesus. Oh, Victory in Jesus. Oh, yeah. Right? We should be excited because life with Christ is so much more enjoyable than life outside of Christ. I was also told that life would become easier. Now, if this meant that Jesus would now be my solution for every problem that I face, that he would always be the answer, and I could claim many different promises in his name, then it's absolutely right. But if life being easier meant that I would never have any problems afterwards, I couldn't disagree more. Because if you followed Christ for any length of time, you know that the closer that you get to Christ, it seems the harder the enemy fights against you. In fact, when you're doing right, that's when it seems to fall down quicker. That's when it seems to come against you. In fact, uh, when you go away from God, it seems that, and this sounds weird, but when you go away from God and you, you depart from his side, it, it appears to us that life seems to get easier. Satan doesn't attack us as much. That's a scary thought. Because we feel like we're rewarded by not actually following him when, in fact, we're going the wrong direction. I've learned that the more that I desire to follow Jesus, the more Satan tries to discourage me. And I know that I'm not telling you anything new. I'm sure that there's many people in this room right now that have gone through some great trials and tribulations. But you know, if you've ever felt this way, you don't have to be discouraged. Because we serve, we serve the God of victories. There is hope for us. We can have victories in our life, but we have to understand what's going on. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. He says, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ. Now, how many of you, when you decided to follow Christ, knew that you were signing up to be a soldier? This is, if you will, a draft, and you can't dodge this one. In fact, uh, in, in the, the great battle, we, know, we, we talk about it a lot. There's a great controversy happening around us. There's a battle going on for our very souls in this universe. And this battle includes us, whether we want it to be include, us to be included or not. There are no neutral nations in this war. It's the universal war. And troubled times are bound to come upon us because there's a war going on. Wars always bring trials. Wars always bring pain and misery. And if you become a soldier of Christ, or when you decide to follow him, you become a soldier of Christ, understand that you're going to find battles. We seem to forget that we have to choose a side. We'll either be for God or against him. And when we choose to become for God, to become a disciple of Jesus, we're automatically chosen to be one of his soldiers. Now understand, again, that if you become one of Christ's soldiers, you automatically put yourself as an enemy of Satan. Right? When you declare one side, you're automatically going against the other side. We love to always say, oh, I'm trying to be balanced here. I want to, I want to appeal to both. We want to be diplomatic. I want to have one foot on God's side and one foot on Satan's side so I don't anger anybody. 
Friends, if you got one foot on Satan's side, you're all on Satan's side. You, you can't, I, you know, people think that they can ride the fence. You don't realize that God doesn't have a fence on his property. If you're riding a fence, it's all on Satan's property. God says you are for me or you're against me. It's plain and simple. So when we choose to join the forces of God, we're automatically taking a stand against his opposition. Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 6. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 10. It confirms this very idea. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not there, say wait. <laughs> verse 10 says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The Bible says we need to put on the whole armor of God. Now, it makes sense, friends. If you're going to be in war, you need to be protected. If you're going to go out in a battle, you need to make sure you have on the right armor. And as a soldier... As we're standing with the armor of God, we're going to have to stand against the schemes of the devil. We realize we become an enemy of Satan. There's going to be trouble. There's going to be fighting. You become a target. No one likes to become a target, do they? And yet when we decide that we're going to follow Christ, Satan puts a target right on us. He's going to try to take us down. Now, it's not because he cares that much about us. It's because he wants to hurt God even more. He wants to destroy the kingdom of God as much as he can. But as in any war, it's important to know where the battlefront is, isn't it? If we're fighting in the wrong places, we're never going to see victory, will we? So where is this battle actually taking place? As we continue reading on, verse 12 shows us the battlefront. He says, Paul says here in verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this dark, present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. He says we don't fight against what? Flesh and blood. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against powers. It's against principalities. It's against the dark forces. It's against the spiritual evil forces in the heavenly places, right? Right? If we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but fighting against those other things, that means our fight is not with the physical things, but with spiritual things. In other words, we're not supposed to be fighting against each other. When our battles are fought right here between us, we're going we're gonna to have a defeat, not victory. In order for us to have victories, we need to be united. Have you ever seen a, an army win when the, the soldiers are against themselves? You probably won't even read about a story like that because it'll end quickly. For, a, for a, a group of soldiers to be able to win a battle, they have to be united. If we're fighting the wrong, each other, we're fighting the wrong battles, we're wasting our strength and we'll never have spiritual victories. We have to focus all of our attention and our energy to fight the real enemy. And that is Satan. You know, Satan is hard at work. We sometimes underestimate him. Remember, the Bible says that when he was cast out of heaven, Revelation says that he came down here filled with fury because he knows his time is short. He's filled with fury. Why aren't we? He's filled with so much passion to take us down, and we go through life as like nothing's going to happen. Knowing that Satan's coming here so strongly, we need to be on guard, shouldn't we? We need, to be, we need to focus all of our attention on the battle, on the, on the, the forces of Satan as he, as he tries to come and attack us. We have no time to waste it on other things. That old serpent, the devil, is not going to stop. So why should we? Now, as soldiers, we need to put on armor. Paul said it right there. He says we have to put on the whole armor of God, not just parts of it, but the whole armor, right? And we're going to talk about that later on in this series. But before we put on armor, what's even more important than the armor, we need to find out what God's plan is. You see, there's no sense going out into the battle 
even though you're fully protected, if you don't know what the plan is. You need to know the battle plan. Amen? How many times do we rush out into things and not know exactly what we're supposed to do? How does that turn out? You know, even if you know the battle plan, if the, the messages get mixed up, you lose the battle. Just ask Napoleon. He had a battle plan, but not everybody got the memo. In fact, many wars are lost. Battles are lost because of people not knowing the plan. So we need to know what God's battle plan is. Armor is important, but it's useless without the right battle plan. So if we desire to see victories in life instead of defeat, listen up, because here is where the victories come from. It's not going to be in our plans. It's not going to be because we, we gather together and we get a committee together and we figure out how we're going to fight. It's because God has the winning plan every time. So what is God's battle plan? It's spelled out for us in Exodus chapter 14. We read this as our scripture reading, and let's go back to it and, and refresh our memories on what it says. Exodus chapter 14 shows us a picture in Israel's history. Now, the people of Israel were in battles quite a bit. Ever since they left Egypt, they faced other nations and they had to fight. In fact, God even told them when they get into Canaan, they were going to have to fight, right? They were going to have to, to, to win Canaan over, but he promised them that he would give them the land of Canaan. It was, they were going to fight, but it wasn't about their efforts. It wasn't about their power, their strengths. And right here in, in Exodus 14, there was, it was an intense moment for Israel. They had recently been freed from slavery in Egypt, but they were trapped by the Red Sea. Now, we don't, maybe don't think of this as a battle, but understand that they were just freed. There were this mob of people, probably a couple million people there, waiting to, to, to see what was going to happen next. They did not know the Red Sea story, friends. Hadn't written, it hadn't been written because it hadn't happened yet. So all they saw in front of them was a great obstacle. And then there was mountains on either side. And what was behind them? Pharaoh. He was coming with his greatest forces. That doesn't sound like a great trip, does it? You can imagine that, that Israel was panicking. They were trapped. This was their first confrontation as followers of God. Not very long after being rescued. You know, friends, it doesn't take long. As soon as you decide to follow Christ, it's going to start happening. You can come up out of the waters of baptism and right then Satan start attacking you, right? He doesn't waste time. So there they were. What were they going to do? Pharaoh's army was coming out. They were ready to bring them back to slavery. And the sight of the army causes the Israelites to wish that they had never left. I think this is amazing. Israel shows us, and it's true to us, I mean, it's still true, we live this out as well, that every time we face these big confrontations, we wish that we hadn't made the decision to follow God in the first place. Sometimes we wish it would have been better if we hadn't followed. Every time Israel faces a big confrontation, every time they find this big obstacle, what is the first thing they wish to do? Go back to Egypt. They always think it's better back in slavery than to face any obstacle that God leads them to. The only reason why they can say this, the only reason why we might say this is because we keep forgetting that when God leads us, he's going to lead us through whatever he brings us to. And it's at this pivotal moment that God reveals his battle plan, a plan that he's going to stick to, a plan that he's, he says throughout scriptures and he leads the Israelites through. And whenever they follow it, they win. It's the core of every battle plan God uses Starting in verse 13, Exodus 14, verse 13, it says, Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. Interesting words. Moses says, listen, I'm going to tell you one of the greatest battle plans you're ever going to hear in your life because this, panel, this, this battle plan results in this way. The Egyptians that are coming at you, you're never going to see them again. That's a pretty good promise, wouldn't you say? 
The trial that you're facing, friend, today, you will never face again. This is the God's battle plan. This is the, 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 the victory that he wants for us. And the first thing that God says in his plan, the very first thing Moses says to the people, it's important for us to understand this as well, the first two words are what? Fear not. The first part of God's battle plan is we are not to be afraid. We have to remember how great our God is. The only reason that we fear when we face obstacles is we forget about the greatness of our God. That's the only reason. It's the reason why they, they got afraid when they saw the, the giants in Egypt. It's the same reason why they got afraid when, when armies would come after. And they'd even hear rumors that an army was coming. But every time God would say the same thing, do not be afraid. Why? Because you can imagine how it would change in a battle, and during the heat of battle, and someone next to you is screaming over and over, we're going to die, we're going to die! Would that give you hope? Would you feel like all encouraged to go and fight? No. Fear spreads quickly. And you cannot win when there's, a, when there's fear. You can't win when there's a scared army. In fact, before any battle... You can read about this in Deuteronomy 20, verse 8, when they were selecting uh, men for the, for, the arm, for the battles, they would tell them, if you're afraid, go home. Uh, if, you were, if, they said, if, you, if you're married, go home. If, if you did this, go home. They knew that if you were going to be distracted by something, and fear was a great distraction, that you weren't, you weren't supposed to be a part of that battle. You weren't supposed to fight. Remember the story of Gideon? The first thing that Gideon says... If you guys are afraid, anybody's afraid, go ahead and go home. They're like, really? Oh, good. So, I've heard about those Midianites. But how did, the, how did it turn out? He ended up with a very small force compared to what was at the beginning. And the force went out there with like trumpets and flashlights and buckets and they made a whole bunch of racket. And the Midianite army was so scared that they fought and killed each other. Right? Have you noticed that God's plans always seem weird? They always seem strange, but he always has victory. He says, I'm going to have you take down the strongest fortified city in all of Canaan. It's called Jericho, and here's the battle plan. I want you to walk around it. Only once each day. And then, then the seventh day, walk around a few times and then play some nice jazzy tune. Blow your trumpets at the end. And then what happens? I, you know, if you've ever watched like Discovery Channel, they always like to look at these, these miracles and they try to figure out, well, you know, this miracle happened because of this. I would love to see them try to explain that one. <laughs> well, the, the nation of Israel was actually big people. And when they walked around, it softened the ground. No, come on. That's amazing. That's God. And if he can do those things and he never changes, that means there's no obstacle in your life right now that he can't conquer, right? So we don't need to be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid. God knows that fear is contagious. And when one person's afraid, it spreads very fast. We have to be courageous. And Paul says we're not given a, a spirit of timidity, timidity, but we're given a, a spirit of, of courage. Boldness. I wonder how many victories we forfeited because of fear. We can be so afraid of defeat and failure that we don't even try. You don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you have not gone and talked to somebody because you're afraid that that person might reject what you have to say? And so just the fear of being turned down, you don't even go. You can't have victories if you don't go, friends, right? Yet God promises us over and over that he will be with us. In fact, he does more than simply be with us. The Bible says he fights for us. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 22, another place God says, Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God himself will fight for you. The reason why there's victories when God is in God's battle plan is because he's the one fighting, not you. It's not based on your strength versus theirs. There's no way David could have gotten rid of Goliath. But God can. Even in the very verse we read, Exodus 14, 13 and 14, it said, you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you, he said. And then the Lord will fight for you, he said. 
we're going to fight. Don't worry. Egypt looks intimidating. You've been afraid of them for years, but don't worry about them because I'm stronger and I'm fighting. This is why David is able to say in Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Or, look in the New Testament. Paul says this in Romans 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, really think about that, friends. If you're on God's side, who can defeat you? And now this is, we're not talking, we're not, our battle is not against flesh and blood, right? We're not, so when we're talking about nobody who, who's against you, we're not talking about, well, this guy at work, he's just really mean to me. He's not talking about that. He's talking about powers and principalities and the evil forces. He's talking about Satan and his forces. They cannot defeat you when God is for you. When you're on God's side. With God as our light, with God as our salvation, with Him as our fortress, with Him fighting, who can we fear? Who is there left to fear? We don't have to fear because God is the one fighting. And He is victorious. Victorious spiritual soldiers are courageous not because of their own strength, not because of their own smarts, but because of their complete trust in the power of God. We go into battle and we can go there knowing we're victorious because we know our God With our God, nothing is impossible. So first thing Moses tells the people to do is to stop being afraid. Do not fear. Remember, he's talking to a a group of people who are probably running around like chickens with their heads cut off. They were were panicking because Egypt was about to take them out. And he said, don't be afraid. Settle down. Here's the next step. After you've Stop being afraid. And remember how great your God is? Moses says, stand firm. Stand your ground. Exodus 14, 13 says, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Stand firm and you will see it. God's plan requires that each of of his soldiers take their stand. You cannot let Satan push you around. Now sometimes when we think of take our stand, we think, God means be stubborn. He's not asking us to be stubborn. In fact, many times throughout the Old Testament, he he, he, uh, talks against the Israelites for being stiff-necked, right? That was stubborn. He doesn't want us to stand our ground against him. And that's often what we do. Well, he says stand our ground, I'm not moving from here ever. Is that what God wants? No, because God is always moving. He wants us to continue walking with Him, continue moving with Him. We must hold our ground. What it means is we must be committed to Him. Stand firm in Him. It's much easier to do when we're not afraid as well. It's a lot easier to hold your ground when you're not afraid because He knows that anything that distracts or preoccupies the soldiers, they will cause more damage than good. So when you join the battle, you cannot be on the fence for whose side you're on. It's interesting, even looking at the story of David and Goliath, you have the whole nation of Israel, including their king, Saul, who were afraid of this man, Goliath. The whole nation was afraid of one man. He may have been big, but it doesn't matter. A whole nation. And David, he knew whose side he was on. When he went there, he had no question. He was on the side of the Almighty Lord, the the, the commander of the heavenly hosts. And he knew if he was on God's side, he wasn't going to lose. So he could go there and stand his ground because he knew which side he was on. You have to to understand and be committed to the cause. It's not being committed to an idea. It's being committed to the plan. That you're going to follow God no matter what he says. Ready and willing to obey. This is, in fact, the sign of a good soldier. A good soldier follows their commander wherever they lead, right? That's what we're supposed to do. Too often we find ourselves running ahead of God. We're doing a whole bunch of things 
we make our own plans, we try to fulfill our plans, and after we're finished, then we ask God if it, later if it's what he wanted us to do. But to be victorious, we must not move unless we're told to move. And when we're told to move, we move. It's like, again, it's like the military. If God says jump, we say how high. <laughs> right? If God says go, when he says, who am I going to send? We should be like Isaiah. Lord, send me. This is the, it's about complete obedience to our commander. If God says, stay still and stand right here, then we stay still and stand. To be victorious, we need to follow God. We'll rest when we're told to rest and fight when we're told to fight. It means we're focused. By standing firm, nothing else in our lives comes before serving our master and his plan. Now, the last part of God's plan is very interesting. He says in, the, in, in Exodus uh, 14, verse 13 and 14, Fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, which he, he will work for you today. For the Egyptians you, whom you see today will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to do what? Some of the translations say, be still. Some of them say, be silent. God's last part is he wants us to be still. I find it interesting that the original Hebrew word here literally means to be silent. Basically, God says, what Moses is telling the people is all you need to do is stop complaining. You want to know what your part in the battle is? Stop being afraid. Stand still, listen for your order, and stop complaining. Now, I think this last one was the hardest one for the Israelites to do. Weren't they the people of complaints? God gives them water, but are they satisfied with the water? God gives them bread from heaven, but are they satisfied with the bread from heaven? Everything, even the good things they complained about. We can't have victory when we're complaining. In fact, right before Moses said this, right be, the reason why Moses came to them and started talking before he, he talked with the Lord and he came to them, the reason why is because they were complaining and saying, Moses, what did you do? You just brought us all out. You rescued us from Egypt just to be killed at the Red Sea? What, what's, what's going on? They were just in the midst of complaining. So Moses says, for this to work, you guys got to stop running your mouth. You got to be quiet. Stop complaining, because, you know, complaining causes doubt. Doubt causes free, fear. Most complaints are not grounded in reality anyway, are they? Just, just think of the 12 spies when they came out of Canaan. Their complaints. The people there, they made us look like locusts. They looked like grasshoppers. We felt like grass. They were so big. Come on, that's not even reality. Is it? Even worse, though, when we complain, we're questioning the battle plan. You see, complaining fo causes us to focus on the problem rather than on God, rather than on the solution. When we're complaining, all it reveals is that we're, we're looking at the problem, and the problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and our, our God is then dwarfed by the problem, in our minds at least. You see, we don't need to point out the problem. The problem is obvious. Right? There's going to be trials in your life, and you can complain about them, but when has complaining about your problem ever done any good? Anybody? Never done any good, has it? But see, not only do we not need to point out the problem, but also, also we can't add to the strategy of God's plan. Sometimes we think by complaining, what we're doing is we're trying to correct God's battle plan. God says, stand still. We say, well, God, you know, I don't know if standing still is the best option for right now. I really think we ought to run. Well, if God wanted you to run, he would have said, run. If he doesn't say run, that means you don't need to run. He'll protect you standing there. His plan is already perfect. So what more could we say? Nothing. Therefore, he says, be silent. There's another reason to be silent. How can you hear what the commander is telling you to do if you're making all the noise? 
This is one thing that Christianity in our day and age have really lost. We do not like silence. So we fill our lives with a lot of noise, don't we? And it's not always audible noise. Sometimes it's digital noise. We find ourselves so immersed on everything that we can't even hear when the commander's trying to tell us to do something. And then we wonder why it feels like God doesn't talk to us, why he doesn't present a solution. I learned this the hard way. I, I was a, for a long time, every time I got in the car, I'd always pop on the radio. Because I, I, in my districts, I always had to travel far, and I never liked the silence in between because I had to think then, you know. <laughs> and I, I was boring when I just thought. So, so I put on the radio, and, and then I would go, and, and I would have these problems, and I'd be praying, and I'd be frustrated because I never, it felt like God was never answering my, my questions, and I, I was frustrated with it. And one day, I got in my car to go on a, an hour trip to my church, my next church, and there was a big problem I was facing, and I was trying to figure out what to do, and I was praying about it, and I went into the car, and I turned on the radio, and it didn't work. And I was forced to drive an hour without the radio, and instead, I spent it in silence listening to God. And you know what? By the time I got to the church, I had the answer. I learned that the radio is not my friend. Noise is not our friend. In fact, friends, when you talk and when you pray, if all you're doing is talking, you're not helping yourself. People can, the reason why Christ was able to spend all night in prayer was not because he was talking the whole time. He was listening. I was told I was given one mouth and two ears because I'm supposed to listen twice as much as I talk. Think about how much we might be missing if we don't actually have silence in our life to hear what God is trying to tell us. He might be, he might be trying to give you the answer. You've been struggling over something and you, you wish that God would speak to you. Maybe you can't hear him because you don't let him speak. You're always doing the talking and when, you, when you're done, I mean... Maybe your prayer life is like this. It's like my prayer life too often. We, we say our prayer, then we get up and we go on our day. We don't spend any time listening to them. How would you like that if someone came up to you and asked for your advice on something, they asked you the question, and as soon as you're about to say something, they turn around and walk off? I got this big problem. Please tell me what to do. They, ask you, they tell you what it is, and then they turn and walk off, and you go, I can't help you if you walk off. You go to the doctor's office. Doc, I got this terrible problem. You explain it all, and then you walk out of the office. And then you complain because the doctor never helps you. They never say anything good. They don't say anything at all. They welcome you, and that's all they do. Are we just walking off on God? Are we spending time? You see, a major part of God's battle plan is that we need to start listening to him. And we can't listen to him if we're the ones talking. We have to be silent. Notice in this story, once Israel stopped complaining, they got to witness the Red Sea parting. It's worth it to stop complaining when you're around God. Friends, you, you see, we're in the middle of a tremendous war, and when we decide to follow Christ, we become his soldiers, and we accept Christ as our Savior, we proclaim Satan our enemy, and so as long as sin exists, we will have trouble in our lives in this world. We can expect it. But God has a plan for victory in our life. He asks us just to do three things. He wants us to, to trust Him. Stop being afraid. We don't have to fear anything that comes in our way because He's greater than everything. And friend, let me tell you that there's nothing that you might face that is too great for God. You may find out from the doctors that you have cancer. God can defeat cancer. You may find out that you might lose your job. You might lose your house. God's greater than that trial, isn't he? God can give us victory in every area of our life, but we need to trust him. And if we do trust him, then we have to stand with him. We have to stand firm. We have to be committed to being on his side. Once we see the trial, the trial going, we can't run back to Egypt. You see, that's what they're afraid of. That's why God says stand firm. Don't run back to slavery. Stay with me. I got you covered. And then finally, we need to be silent. Let God, let God talk to us. You see, God doesn't need super soldiers. He, he's not asking for mighty fighting machines. He's got angels. They can do a lot more than we can. 
One angel can take out an army. He doesn't need our, our physical strength or our brains. What he needs in us are soldiers that will stand. Those who will stand firm and watch him give us victory. He doesn't ask us to be the best fighters. He's not asking us to have faith in our strength. He's not even asking us to fight. He just asks us to stand. He's asking us to stand for him. So are there trials in your life? Anybody here having a struggle lately? A trial that you might be facing? God says, stand firm. He's your refuge. Our temptations attacking more than ever. Stand firm. God is your strength. Are there more losses than victories in your spiritual life? God says, stand firm. He's your salvation. In other words, when Satan tries to advance in your life, don't run back to him. Don't run back to slavery. Stand firm. Now we have to remember, victory is not winning every battle. Victory is about winning the war. Amen? Amen? So you may expect to get some bumps and bruises. You, may accept, you, you have to understand that you will experience pain and misery because as long as Satan is still in control, that's part of our life. And there are some times when God answers our prayer, he doesn't rescue us from the trial, but he goes through the trial with us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went into that fire furnace, but there was another one in there with them. God went in there with them. He may not take you away from the trial, but he'll go through that trial. There will be losses. There will be struggles and pain. You may feel like giving up. You may think that God has abandoned you. But friends, don't give up. Because he promises that he, has not, he will not abandon you. Jesus says, and after he told us to go and make disciples, when he knew we were going to go and face the world, he says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the very end. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Is Jesus a liar? That means he's with us right now, amen? amen? That means he's with you when you're in the doctor's office. He's with you when you're at work. He's with you when you're at home. He's with you every moment when you're facing a trial. He's there with you. He won't leave you, friends. You can leave him, but he won't ever leave you. And we've come upon a pivotal time in our history. We're, we're standing on the shores of troubled times, and our enemy is closing in to steal, kill, and destroy. He's trying to make us feel like the disciples felt on that first weekend after they saw Jesus die. They want to make us feel that we're defeated. But friends, Sunday's right around the corner. Amen. Jesus is coming very soon. And when he comes, friends, it's, it's done. <laughs> this time he's coming. He's not coming to, to be, walk on this earth again and be killed again. He's coming here as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The final victory. We've seen God's battle plan and it's 100% effective and so we have to choose. Every time the Bible makes us choose, it's time for us to choose which side we're going to be on. It's time for us to choose who we're really following. It's time to choose whether or not we will accept God's plan because here's the key, friends. Most often we have losses, we have defeat in our life because we decide to add to or completely avoid God's plan for victory. You see, God's plan of victory is very simple. Trust Him. Our plan is, trust us. Our plan never works, friends. Even the times it feels like we have victory, it's not victory. So whose side are you on? If we choose God, then we need to stop being afraid. We can't let the giants in the land make us feel like grasshoppers. We need to be like Joshua and Caleb, and say, our God is greater than them. Let's go take it. We don't need to be af afraid because our God is mighty. If we choose to follow God's plan, then, then we need to wait, learn to wait for the order, and then move. If, if God is leading, then he needs to be in front. If he's leading us, then he's be the one that we're following, not somebody else. If we choose God, we need to keep silent. Listen, if we choose to trust God, we'll see victory, friends. If you trust him, he will take you through. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, when God takes you through something, 
it's always a great story. It's always a miracle. Because when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the fiery furnace, and God went through it with them, when they came out, you couldn't even smell smoke on them. Now that's a miracle, friends. I worked at Walmart for a while, and when I went into the break room, I couldn't come out smelling like smoke. I, I, came, I would smell like smoke just coming out of the break room. They went into a furnace, and they didn't smell like smoke. Have you, been to, have you ever gone camping? You know how it is after you've been camping and you have that, that campfire there? When you come, all your clothes smell like campfire. And you didn't even get in it, I hope. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the middle of a furnace that was heated seven times hotter than normal. And they didn't even smell like smoke. See, that's the victory that God will, wants to give you. That when you come out of this terrible trial, you won't even smell the smoke of the trial on you. That's why I love those stories when doctors go and they say, I can't even tell the person had cancer. Praise the Lord. That's our God. So friends, I, I call you to a choice today. I call you to stand. To stand for God. To stand for battle. We can't let Satan win anymore. We can't let him have any more advances because he's having a lot of victories around us and it's, it's time for that to be done. Amen? Amen. The choice is yours. As a disciple, as a soldier, it's up to you. As Joshua said many years ago, before they entered Canaan, I say to you today, choose today whom you will serve. You're either going to choose the gods of the worldly distractions and selfish desires and man's plan, man's plans, or you're going to choose God. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Will you stand with me today to make that that decision, if, it's your desire, if you want to stand for God and make him commander of your life in this, this battle that we have, stand with me right now. And we're going to pray and we're going to ask for God to bless us in this. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray, friends. Father in heaven, we're standing here in front of you because we desire to see victory in our life. Father, we know that nothing is impossible for you. We know that you are... A, you're successful every time. Now, we don't always understand your plan. We don't always understand why some battles seem to be losses to us and some seem to be wins. But we know that if we stay with you, if we will stand firm in our trust of you, that the very end will be victory. Sometimes we'll feel like we've been abandoned. Sometimes we will feel like the disciples when they saw Jesus on the cross and feel like everything is over, that we've lost the greatest battle ever only to realize that you have some great miracle waiting around the corner. Father, help us to trust you so we can stand victorious. So one day when, when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, he will be able to look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servants. And we'll finally be able to go home. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.